and welcome to South to North, coming to you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Think of a leader, any world leader. Chances are you'll think of a man. Today, we meet two world leaders who are challenging those assumptions. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is a former French finance minister and now the first female head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. We'll also meet Africa's first female Anglican bishop, Elina Wamukoya, ordained in Swaziland just as the Church of England voted not to allow women to become bishops. But first up, Christine Lagarde. Ms. Lagarde, welcome to South to North. Now, let's start here. Forbes mentioned you as one of the top most powerful women in the world. How does that feel? Feels good. <laughs> Just good. <laughs> I, I don't really pay too much attention to these rankings and these assessments and these, you know, uh, recognition and awards because it lasts for as long as you are trying to do a good job. And it's the second part of the uh, proposition that really matters to me, trying to do as good a job as I can in circumstances that are difficult at the moment. But it must mean a lot to get compliments from your colleagues. I mean, one IMF insider says that you are enormously impressive, politically astute, and he says that you have a strong personality and everywhere you go in finance, in the financing world, you are described as a rock star. Now, is it because you are doing a good job, you are good at your job, or are you just a woman who's good at her job? Uh, you know, really, in, in, in current times, uh, it's probably a combination of both because it is still a little bit unusual to have a woman in the financial world, uh, which is essentially male dominated. But I would hope that by doing as good a job as I can, irrespective of whether I'm a woman or not, I can phase into a time when my successors, if they are female, uh, can just be regarded as doing a good job and the gender uh, aspect of it will be, will be irrelevant. I think it is still a bit relevant and there is an element of uh, discrimination for a portion of your life or a portion of your career which you have to cope with, deal with and overcome. And then after that, that element becomes eventually a benefit that you can draw from uh, in, in, a, in a respectful and dignified manner as well. Mm -hmm. Now, despite those assumptions about women, you have managed to reach the helm of the IMF. Would you say that the glass ceiling still exists? It exists for many, many and too many women uh, around the world, in the financial sector as well as in other sectors. When you look at the, the, the wage, wage difference between a man and a woman doing the same job, when you look at the number of women in uh, the political arena, when you look at the number of women in uh, uh, you know, high-level positions in companies, whether it's on the boards or whether it's at the executive levels. Uh, yeah, there are plenty of glass ceilings to be, to be broken. And, uh, and it, it happens uh, over time, gradually, incrementally, sometimes a bit faster in some countries. Uh, and I wish, I wish it would mm -hmm. happen more, more often and faster. I've always wanted to ask you this. You have bluntly blamed the 2008 financial crisis on the male-dominated and testosterone-fueled culture of global financing. Is anyone listening? Is that ever going to change? Well, I did say so. I did repeat it. I will continue to repeat it. Uh, generally, people, people hear what I say. Uh, changing the culture, uh, changing the attitude, bringing in more, more women to the, uh, uh, to the trading floors. Uh, is, is something that I hope will happen over time uh, and uh, that we will have more and more diverse environments in, in finance, in banking, as well as in other sectors as well. But uh, I think that, you know, I, I don't take advantage of my position in, in any respect except, except you know, to be heard on that particular point. Make sure that there is space for women at all tables. All right, there's still a lot of turmoil in the global economy, but you have managed in your tenure as uh, IMF head to stabilize some economies. And yet you have previously said in some interviews that some of the male counterparts still speak to you in a patronizing manner. How do you deal with that? What do you do? <laughs> I smile. I think, you know, smile and a good sense of humor 
uh, are, are extremely helpful to deal with that. But you know, I'm not sure that I have by myself stabilized uh, lots of things. Uh, the IMF is, is really trying to contribute and to help in stabilizing, but it has a lot to do with what uh, national governments, local authorities and the people are prepared to do for their economy, for their financial markets uh, in order to stabilize the situation for their own good and for the good of their neighbors and the, the whole community. Let's talk about the IMF. Since its establishment after World War II, there has never been anybody but a European heading it. Nobody from Africa, nobody from Asia. Will that ever change? When will we have an IMF head from another part of the world, particularly because those economies are growing while the economies in the Eurozone are declining? You're right. The... Um, a lot of the growth that we have observed over the last few years uh, has been generated by emerging and low-income countries. So there is a shift. There is a geopolitical as well as an economic shift that is happening before our eyes. But there is a lot of catching up to be done. So when you look at the size of uh, advanced economies relative to the global economy, they are still uh, large players much larger than emerging market economies uh, and low-income countries in, in, in a way. So times are changing. The balance of power is changing. There's a major shift around the world, as I said, geopolitically and economically. And international financial institutions have to reflect that. They have to be representative of their membership, which is why the IMF membership is more adequately represented now uh, as a result of the reforms that have taken place since 2006. Uh, those who have to give up portion of their authority, power and voice are not always happy to do so, whereas the other ones are very eager uh, to obtain that shift. What role will you be playing to make sure that the playing fields are leveled between the two worlds? I don't think that there are two worlds. Uh, there, there, there is one world with a great diversity. You know, when we, when we talk, for instance, about emerging market economies, in those emerging market economies, there are crying needs for some very poor people. And, uh, you know, I would not regard them as one single category, one single group, nor would I regard the advanced economies as constituting one single group. So this idea about having two different worlds, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't feel comfortable with it. I think we have one world with significant variations, differences, issues about diversity, issues about uh, more inclusive growth, issues about reducing inequality, including in those emerging market economies that are growing in size and, and claiming more space. So the role that I'm trying to play is to identify those uh, new themes, making sure that whenever we provide surveillance or lending or technical assistance, we do it in an even-handed manner, but also being mindful of the characteristics of those economies and those regions within which we are providing either technical assistance, uh, lending or surveillance. We, we need to be very receptive uh, to the characteristics of domestic markets. And as I said, there is a great diversity within each and every domestic markets. And we need to be attentive to uh, the effects that policies have, not only at home, but outside. And that's what we call the spillover effects of all the economic policies that, the, that are decided uh, around the world. Speaking about uh, the, the, the policies uh, around the world, you were criticized for saying you are more concerned for African children who are deprived of an education than those who are suffering in, Gre in Greece. The Greeks called you uh, hypocritical and the Africans felt that you were stereotyping them. What did you mean? You know, I was, I was just returning back from a, a very, very informative, sometimes very emotional trip uh, to Niger. And we were working at the same time on the Greek program, uh, finding out that the, the tax collection was very short of uh, expectations and finding out about the um, significant tax evasion um, 
characteristic of that economy, which the authorities recognize now and against which they are fighting. So when I was asked about Greece, I did refer to the fact that I was more mindful, more moved uh, by what I had seen uh, in you know, some uh, primary schools in Niger than I was about uh, the current Greek situation because of the failure of some of the Greek population to honor their obligation and to pay their tax. Mm -hmm. And I still feel the same way. I'm only very pleased to see that the Greek authorities are now really trying to deal with the issue and to, to collect tax as they should. Let's talk about something really, really important now. You've been criticized not only for what you say, but also what you wear. You know, really, it's not so much fashion. It's um, a concern about respecting um, other people. It's a concern about showing uh, dignity and respect. And you can demonstrate that in multiple ways. Back at home, my mother always told me, you know, dress properly, be attentive to color coordination, and uh, it's a way for you to show respect to other people. Not to look clumsy, not to, to be, you know, sort of uh, complacent about the way in which you, you dress. So <laughs> I don't present any apologies for that. That's the way I was brought up, and that's, uh, that's who I am. I'll go along with that. Now, you have decided to visit an African country, Malawi, in Southern Africa, our neighbor here in South Africa. Did you choose Malawi because it has a female president? Why Malawi? Well, you, you gave the answer. <laughs> do, do you find Joyce Banda impressive? What do you like about Joyce Banda? I was, I was most impressed by the, the, um, the president of Malawi. I told her that I would make a point of uh, visiting her when she... Uh, invited me to visit her country, and I'm delivering on my promise. Mm -hmm. Wherever I can give support to women in, in difficult, tough position, tough spots, uh, and I know that being the leader of a country is a tough spot, uh, I, will, I will do so. Mm -hmm. You also visited Colombia, and you uh, put on your Facebook page that you were impressed with the female entrepreneurs in Bogota. What was so inspirational about them? And can you tell me a little bit more about the unique challenges they face? Whenever I visit a country, I try to meet with uh, the, uh, you know, what we call civil society, and not to just move around the exclusive circles of uh, finance ministers and governors of central banks. I want to see the people who are facing uh, the difficulty of getting access to finance, the difficulty of... Uh, accessing markets, the difficulty of exporting, the difficulty of hiring uh, in, in, a, in a formal as opposed to informal way. And uh, I had the opportunity to do that in Colombia uh, with uh, an association of women entrepreneurs and owners of their, of their business, which very often they had created. And there were small, medium-sized, large enterprises. Uh, all of them shared their concern, their problems. I've mentioned some of them, uh, access to finance, ability to market new products, uh, ability to uh, register patents and have the funding to do so, uh, concern about the support they were getting from their authorities, and, uh, and also the joy of uh, hiring people from their community, often women, sometimes uh, uh, young, young women uh, who could not get jobs otherwise. And it was a very... Uh, a very rewarding uh, session, if you will, both for them, I think, because um, some of them just didn't know each other very well uh, or didn't know each other at all. And, uh, and for me, because I heard, you know, firsthand what difficulties they faced in their country. As a, as a young professional woman, I face the challenge that many of my peers face, that we're going into the workplace, we're making our voices heard, we are community workers, but you still have to go home and juggle all those different roles. How does Christine Lagarde do that, the personal and the professional? Well, just like you, I, I have to, um, you know, struggle with multiple things and I, and, and I have to, uh, to do my, my shopping and I have to do, uh, you know, my ironing and, and I do a few things that people don't suspect I do, <laughs> um, you know, including very, very uh, trivial tasks like, like that. But 
Number one, I don't complain because I've been lucky and, uh, and, and privileged in many ways all my life because I worked hard, uh, made enough of a living in order to have a bit of support at home. Uh, my mother helped me a little bit uh, at some stage very early on, but I still, I still do lots of other things. My very strong recommendation uh, for, for young women uh, who, who begin their, their journey in life, both personally and professionally, is to make sure that they're going to live with the right person who will accept uh, that they also want to have a profession, that they also want to um, spend time outside uh, dealing with either community issue or professional issues. And when they get back home, they have the support of somebody who is also going to give a hand and, and take his share or her share of responsibilities. Thank you very much, Christine Lagarde, for speaking to us on South to North. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. That was Christine Lagarde, who most definitely has broken into a world previously reserved for men. Here in South Africa, equal rights for men and women is now enshrined in our constitution, which is a great thing. But of course, any amount of words doesn't necessarily lead to action. One of the areas of life worldwide where women have indeed struggled to be treated equally is religion, of course. This year, 2012, the Church of England voted controversially not to allow women bishops to be ordained. There is talk now that the decision may be reviewed, but in the meantime, here in Southern Africa, we have led the way. A few days before the Church of England's decision, the Church's Southern Africa body consecrated its first female bishop, Elina Wamukoya. We've just spoken to Christine Lagarde. What did you think of her? I think Christine was great. She was warm. She knew her stuff. And I was very happy about the way she handled even whatever I would have thought controversial. She was calm and collected. She came out as somebody who knows what she's all about. Well, you are in the same league as far as breaking the mold, leading the way and opening doors for women. Did you ever think the day would come when you are ordained bishop? Well, the, the difference between me and Christine is that mine is a calling while maybe Christine uh, is a job and she applied for a job. But, uh, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Uh, first of all, just becoming a priest was never in my plate of things. And, uh, you know, through God calling me, I found myself a priest, least of all to become a bishop. But here I am now because, you know, we never know the ways of God in our life. What, what do you think about the fact that the Church of England voted against allowing women to lead the church, women such as yourself? Well, I, I sympathize with the women in England because I know that they are ready, you know, to take their ministry a step further. However, you know, there is autonomy in the Anglican uh, communion so all I can say is that as a church and as a communion, we will continue to pray for the church in England that, you know, their discernment may eventually lead them to understand that uh, women are equally good in the Episcopate ministry as men. But isn't that problematic that um, almost half of the people who voted this way, who voted against allowing women bishops, were women themselves. Is that particularly uh, disappointing for you? It is disappointing. It is not disappointing. You know, you have to be real in your outlook of things. You look at the, 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 the political arena in the secular world. Most MPs and ministers are men. Mm -hmm. And who votes those men into office? It is us women. And most in the rural areas, the MPs that come from there are voted by women because the men are at work. But you can't also blame them, you know, for that. It also partly has to do with our societies that are patriarchal. We are brought up that way that the male voice is always, you know, the voice to be heard. But we hope that with time, and as we have seen, things are going to change. A lot of women globally, we've just heard from Christine as well, do come from a patriarchal society. 
how do you reconcile the conservatism of the church, the patriarchal society from which you also come, with your own feminist beliefs? Well, I mean, the, 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 the church in, in the Bible, for instance, uh, you never hear of the female disciples. I wondered where they were amongst the 12. They, they were there. They were, Jesus had female disciples, and it is known. And if you go to Luke, Luke does talk about a lot of women that were Jesus' followers. But of course, you know, those societies were playing, downplaying uh, women. And, you know, scripture has been interpreted to favor men over women. Um, so that combined with our patriarchal societies has worked against uh, women climbing the ladders in all aspects of life. You come from a country around South Africa, the kingdom of Swaziland. Mm -hmm. Your king, King Swati, is not very popular, especially in, amongst people who have embraced democracy. He's an absolute monarch with many wives and accused of running the economy to the ground while he and his family have not suffered. What are your views on King Mswati? Right now, I don't believe that uh, it is in my powers to go and confront the king and tell him you are not doing this and that. But I think the voice of the church can be heard. I believe that it is, the church has to lead by example first. You know, as a church, we should be good stewards of whatever has been given to us in our hands. And as a church, we have the poor around us. While the, the government is expected to do things for the, the poor and marginalized, even us as the church, we should be trailblazers and go out there and be with the people. Mm -hmm. And then we can come back and talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am not quite saying that the church should just sit back and be quiet and, and, and not say anything uh, to uh, unjust laws. But I think where Swaziland is right now, um, it's a step ahead. Mm -hmm. For instance, we now have a constitution. Uh, lately, the constitution is being criticized. And uh, the people who are criticizing the, the constitution are not in jail. And I would rather say, let them continue to criticize the constitution. For me, these things are not a once-off thing. They are processes. Mm -hmm. So the space so we, is we, open exactly, for that Exactly. We have to be patient. We have to continue talking. We have to continue doing things, but we cannot expect things to change uh, overnight. So having a constitution for me was the first step. And I know coming from uh, working for local government that through uh, uh, the World Bank doing pro projects in Swaziland, there has been a lot of shift even in our land laws. There, there are policies now that allow women to, to own land. Mm -hmm. Something which was not heard of before. Okay, so but you're sounding very positive about the direction that Swaziland is and taking. And you know what? Okay. The, 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 it's, it's, it's now left with Parliament to, you know, uh, make the relevant laws that will deal with those kind of issues. Well, we are we have a vested interest in Swaziland's su uh, success. The sooner that happens, the better. Mm -hmm. But Bishop, we spoke to Christine, and I didn't know that she irons her co own clothes. I'm sure you heard her say she irons her own clothes. Yeah. What, do you, what do you do uh, to relax outside of the church when the gown, or is it a cassock? It's a cassock that you wear. When it's off and you're off the pulpit, what does the bishop do? I enjoy washing my own clothes. <laughs> so you can take it, them to Christine relaxes, to iron. It relaxes me. Uh, I, well, I used to love cooking, but not anymore. But then I would, uh, from time to time, sit, uh, watch TV. You know, Al Jazeera, like I'm speaking to you I'm today. I'm delighted to I hear do that. watch Al, Al Jazeera. And um, yeah, some of the Nigerian movies, I love them. Oh, the bishop who likes to watch TV. Yeah. I've loved having you here. Thank you yeah. very much for visiting us on South to North and congratulations with your ordination. And I hope uh, that there'll be many happy days ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on South to North. See you again next time. Goodbye.